Today's podcast is sponsored by Mint Mobile. Get your new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gold. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. I'm back. I hope everybody had a happy uh, Easter holiday weekend and that you didn't fall for too many April Fool's Day pranks today, although for most investors, I think every day is April Fool's Day. And, you know, a lot has happened uh, since my last podcast. And again, if you're not sure why I've been missing in action, if you don't recall, I mentioned it uh, on the last podcast I did, which was almost two weeks ago. I was going to be away for spring break in Mexico. I had expected to do a podcast from Mexico, but wasn't able to do it because of the internet connection at the ranch uh, where I had expected to do my podcast from. I started my Mexican trip in Mexico City. Now, had I, I tried to do the podcast from my hotel there, I would have been able to do it, but I, I just waited. I thought I would do it a little bit later. I was in Mexico City, by the way. It was the first event for the total access members of uh, my new venture, Shift Sovereign, which was really a merger between Sovereign Man, which was run by James Hickman, and kind of my own uh, social media. And we came together to form Shift Sovereign. So this was the first event. Most of the uh, Total Access members had been members for a long time. So they were there before we merged. And this was the first, I think, Total Access event that I'd been to. I'd been to some of the other uh, bigger um, conferences that Sovereign Man had, but this one was for the Total Access members. I mean, maybe I was at one, I forget, you know, many, many years ago, but it really was a great event in Mexico City. And Mexico City, by the way, if you haven't been there, I would encourage a trip. It is a, a magnificent city. I was very pleasantly surprised. Not that I was expecting it to be a dump, uh, but it was a really nice city. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in a lot of major cities around uh, the world and Mexico City, you know, stacks up with the best of them. Beautiful streets, very clean, tree lined, beautiful trees, lots of green. There wasn't a lot of traffic. I mean, in the main part of the city or wherever I was staying, uh, great restaurants. Um, uh, so I, I would definitely encourage people to to visit Mexico City. But I think the best part of the the, the event, the conference, other than we had some great speakers, in, including Vicente Fox, who was the president of Mexico about 20 years ago, really, really interesting man who actually had surgery three days before the event, yet he still was able to come and speak to our group. But it's the group itself. There's a lot of really high caliber uh, total access members. And I think the opportunity to network with other members is probably as valuable as being there with James and me and all of the other speakers uh, that we invited to the event. So I would encourage people the next time they open up uh, registration because it's a limited time. You know, we try to keep the number down. There was about maybe 100, and 100, 125 people at the event. But next time, if you have the opportunity to join Total Access, you should take a look at doing that or consider doing that. You can look into it at shiftsovereign.com. Meanwhile, make sure you're getting the free newsletter that comes out every day. If you're not getting it, go to the on the website, you can sign up. And there's also a premium newsletter, Shift Sovereign Premium that you can sign up for. But anyway, also after I left Mexico City, we spent four nights there. We went to a, a dude ranch because I had my kids because we were there uh, for spring break. Uh, and we went to this place, uh, Rancho Las Casadas, uh, which is about an hour, hour and a half north, I think, of Mexico City. And I, I highly recommend the place. I mean, they're not they're not sponsoring the podcast. We just had a great time there. The kids loved it. It really is spectacular desert scenery, wide open spaces. So if you like the desert, if you like to ride horses, they have beautiful horses. I mean, very well uh, maintained horses. I mean, very clean and friendly and, and obedient. Uh, and, you know, we went out two, um, uh, two rides a day, probably an hour and a half, two hours a day. Uh, morning ride, uh, a later afternoon ride. In between, we got great meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's all included. It's a very nice experience. The kids, 
And my wife actually can't wait to go back. We met people uh, from all around the world who found out about this, you know, place in Mexico to ride horses because you don't usually get the opportunity to just take these horses out into these wide open plains and just canter, gallop. I mean, a lot of times you're stuck on a trail and you're kind of, you know, nose to tail in, in a line and you really don't do anything. But here you really had a chance to ride and, and take in some magnificent scenery. Uh, so, I, you know, we'll be going back, I think. But I would definitely encourage people, uh, if you like to ride horses, uh, you know, this is a, a great place to be. And it was, you know, it's a great bargain as far as I think what I paid, I forget. But it was very, I think, inexpensive relative to uh, the value uh, that, that I had there. But anyway, the one thing I guess that wasn't great was the upload speed of the Wi-Fi. I mean, they had Wi-Fi. It worked perfectly just, you know, for most purposes, but not for doing the podcast. So instead of doing the podcast, I had to wait until today because I just got back. I mean, we flew in uh, late this afternoon. And so I'm doing the, the, the first podcast that I can. But of course, I was very interested in talking because the whole time that I'm away, I'm on this vacation, I'm watching the price of gold just relentlessly going up day after day after day. In fact, last night, Sunday night, we made a new record high. Gold was up about $30 at one point last night. It traded above 2260 Now, I mean, $30 on a Sunday night, that's very rare to see that kind of move. But what's even more rare is that there was no news. It's not like something happened. Nobody dropped the bomb anywhere, right? It just went up. And that was on top of the near $40 rise that gold had on Friday before the holiday weekend. So you're talking about like a $70 rise, 3% move in, in, in really, you know, a little bit more than one day, you know, from Friday to early Sunday. Right. Very rare to have that kind of move. But also very rare was the complete lack of attention that the gold rally has been getting. You know, I I didn't get a chance, you know, to, to watch, you know, financial television all day long because I was doing other things. But um where I was in Mexico, it was two hours early. And so I kept getting up, you know, 5 a.m. And my family generally slept till around seven, right? We didn't have breakfast until about eight. And then we went out riding. So I got up early and I was able to watch, you know, the squawk box on CNBC in the morning. And they don't mention gold at all. I mean, they had Anthony Pompliano was on this morning at seven, seven, 10 in the morning. This is following this big spike up in the price of gold. Now it had come down uh, in our our time zone. I mean, that's basically what happens. It rallies in Asia as the Asian central banks are buying and some smart Asian investors. And then when it rolls into our time zone, the dumber American investors, they sell the rally. And I guess they need more money to buy these Bitcoin ETFs. So Anthony Pompliano comes on. Gold's just hit a record high. He's interviewed for 10 minutes. They don't mention gold once. They're only talking about is Bitcoin. And in fact, well, the, the funny thing that that, that that Anthony said, you know, he, he's, he's doing an interview and he claimed that Bitcoin doesn't have a marketing department, that the only thing that advertises Bitcoin is its price and its returns. And, and so, you know, the price going up is really what's what's driving everything because there's nobody doing any marketing. And I'm just laughing at myself. I mean, it's all marketing. What is he talking about? I mean, he's he's an army. He's a soldier in the Bitcoin army. In fact, he, he, he I actually he's he's not just a soldier. He's he's an officer, right? He's high ranking. He's one of the leaders of that army to constantly pump Bitcoin. And the biggest irony is he's claiming that Bitcoin doesn't have a marketing department on CNBC, which is a network that is basically dedicated to promoting Bitcoin. And I think that that's why they're not talking about gold, because I remember, you know, not too long ago. They talked about gold every day. I mean, they didn't, you know, harp on it, but they mentioned it. Now they don't even mention it. It's like it doesn't even exist. When the price was going nowhere, when it was going down, yeah, they pointed that out. But now that it makes a new high every day, it's not even discussed. And so there's no way that that could be accidental, right? It's not an oversight. 
they are purposely not talking about gold. Now, there could be several reasons why they don't want to talk about gold. I mean, one might be that the Bitcoin advertisers don't want the public to know that gold is actually going up now because they might actually buy that instead of Bitcoin. So maybe that's part of it. And, you know, I saw a chart. I, it, this hadn't occurred to me until I saw uh, it was tweeted out. Uh, I, and, and so I saw uh, th this chart of uh, the Bitcoin price in gold. And I thought it was interesting. While Bitcoin made a new high in dollars in this recent run, it got up to like 73,000. And I think the, the old high was around 69,000. So Bitcoin made a new high in dollars. It didn't make a new high in gold. And of course, it got crushed against gold today because it was down 1% or 2% and gold was up a percent. Uh, and so it's falling further below it's high. But Bitcoin's price in terms of gold was in 2021. We didn't even take out that high in, in 2022. So we'll see. I mean, maybe Bitcoin is never going to make a new high in gold. That would be very interesting. But there could be another reason that CNBC and other financial analysts don't want to talk about gold is because of the message that gold is sending. Because what gold is telling you and gold is making new highs the way it is and gold is not just some commodity i mean it is a commodity but it's a special commodity right? so if let's say pork bellies were making a new high every day all right i mean i could forgive cnbc for not talking about it right i mean it's just one commodity right i mean it's not that significant but gold is special because of the monetary properties and the monetary role that gold plays. I mean, if anything can be said to be the canary in the coal mine, it's gold. And, and so you've got this warning and nobody is paying attention to the message, even reporting that the warning bell has been sounded. What is gold? telling people if they're smart enough to listen. What gold is screaming is that what the Fed is contemplating is a mistake. That cutting interest rates, whenever these cuts begin, is the wrong policy. That interest rates are actually too low and they need to go up. But the Federal Reserve and the financial media are ignoring this warning. And the investors, I mean, you know, they, they, they are clueless, right? The warning is falling on, on, on deaf ears. And maybe one of the reasons is they don't even know that the warning's been sounded because the financial media has got radio silence on this stealth gold rally. And imagine, too, if the public knew that gold was going up and they had some inkling of why, they'd be buying too. Imagine how much higher the price of gold would be right now if the American public was actually buying it or if they weren't selling it, which is what they have been doing. They've been liquidating. I think the liquidations now maybe have you know come to a come to an end. I'm not sure. But for months and months, all year. They have been selling gold through the GLD. Meanwhile, this is one of the best years ever. I mean, maybe this is the best start to a year. I haven't researched it yet. But if it's not the best year ever, it's one of them. Right? We're up, I don't know, what we're up 14% or 15% this year in, in, in the price of gold. Um, but that's with the public selling gold, right? Who's buying it? I mentioned it in previous podcasts. It's foreign central banks. They're the ones that are buying and maybe other uh, wiser individuals in, in, in Asia. That's why we have these big rallies overnight. And then we have sell offs here in the United States. Anyway, I got a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. So don't go anywhere.
after years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by overpriced wireless providers, if we've learned anything, is that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile wireless plans start at just $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they sell wireless services online. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass the sweet savings directly to you. That's why when my young son Preston was ready for a cell phone of his own, Mint Mobile fit the bill perfectly. Now you can say bye-bye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected charges. Mint Mobile is here to rescue you with premium wireless plans that start at just 15 bucks a month. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. So ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's limited-time deal and get three months of premium wireless service for just 15 bucks a month to get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month go to mintmobile.com slash gold that's mintmobile.com slash gold cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gold 45 dollars upfront payment required equivalent to 15 dollars a month for new customers on the first three-month plan only speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan additional taxes fees and restrictions apply see mint mobile for details all right so i want to talk about the the warning that gold is is sending signaling to the markets you know i remember when i was listening to an interview with alan greenspan back in maybe 2002 three four somewhere then and he was asked about the gold standard and, of course, he was a proponent of the gold standard before he became Fed chairman. And he still believed in it. In fact, some of his interviews, if you listen to them, there's still some of them up on the Internet. He mentioned that he believed that the U.S. economy did better uh, under a gold standard than it did uh, uh, with the Federal Reserve. And, and he talked about that he didn't think that we needed a Federal Reserve or a central bank. But he, he mentioned that, well, the public wants one. And that, you know, we're in a democracy, although I would take issue with that. It's supposed to be a republic. But Greenspan basically said, look, even though I personally believe that a gold standard is better than having a central bank, the, the people want a central bank. He said that we live in a democracy and so we have to compromise. And so one of the things that Greenspan compromised on was accepting a central bank, even though he personally preferred a gold standard. And he had that. Uh, preference during his entire tenure as Fed chairman and after he retired. And I'm sure he still has it, you know, today, uh, uh, that preference. But in this particular interview, when he admitted that we're not on a gold standard, he said that he has a kind of de facto gold standard in that he watches the price of gold. And he listens to the messages, the signals that gold is setting. And I think the price that he was looking at at the time was $400. And so he said that if gold is moving above $400 an ounce, I know that my monetary policy is too easy and I need to tighten, we need to raise rates. But if gold is too far below 400, then it means I'm too tight and we can ease up. I think that was a number, I mean, I, I mean, it was 20 years ago, so I can't remember exactly, but there was a price of gold at the time that he was watching and he was taking that market signal uh, and responding to it. So he said, look, we're not officially on a gold standard, but unofficially I'm running monetary policy as if there was some kind of gold standard, right? So at least Alan Greenspan acknowledged the significance of gold. Well, here you have gold moving to all-time record highs and there's no sign that this run is going to stop. I mean, I think it's early, right? And crickets <laughs> out of pow, right? The Fed is not paying any attention to it. Now, what is gold telling the Fed? Because this is what Greenspan would have heard, right? Because that's why he looked at it. The price of gold is moving up. And this says that you're too easy. And how do we know we're too easy? Well, the Fed is going to cut rates. In fact, they reiterated, 
you know, Powell had a speech uh, last week and he reiterated that they're on track for, I don't know, two or three rate cuts this year. Despite all of this evidence that is being downplayed by the media, that inflation is about to get worse. Look, oil prices hit a five-month high today. We're just at $84 a barrel now. But look at the chart. It's going much higher. Look at commodities. The CRB was up again today. We're up about 13% so far this year. Think about that. 13%. It's just one quarter. The first quarter ended. I think for the first quarter, we were up 12%. And now we're up almost another percent today in the first day of the second quarter. Now, last year, 2023, the CRB was basically flat the entire year. Now, it went up quite a bit in 2022, but last year, it kind of flatlined. It was went sideways all year. This year, we're already up 13%, and we're at the first day of April. Now, does that seem consistent with lower inflation, a falling CPI? Should the CPI be lower in 2024 than it was in 2023 when commodity prices are already up 13% in 2024 and they weren't up at all in 2023? All of the data that we're getting shows that the CPI is about to head a lot higher. And all the other reports that we get show, we got more reports that came out today uh, on ISM that showed tremendous pricing pressure in these reports. Uh, so we have all this evidence. The Fed says they're data dependent. Well, why are they ignoring all of this data that says everything they're saying about inflation is BS? I mean, Powell keeps saying, yes, we're confident. We think inflation is going to go back down to 2%. Why? Why should it do that? What gives him this confidence? Just because he's raised interest rates up to five and a quarter percent? Big deal. That's not a high rate of interest, especially when you have a a big inflation problem like, like the one we got now. You know, I look back at some of the statistics on inflation to just see, you know, how often we had inflation of 2%. And there was a 30-year period between 1966 and 1996, 30-year period, which obviously includes the 1970s, but 30-year period, only one year, one year of those 30 years did we have inflation of 2% or lower. So the other 29 years inflation was above 2%. And in fact, the lowest inflation year of those 29 years, the lowest was 2.5%. So we were still far away. A half a percent is still far away from two. And that was the closest we got during those 29 years. Now, if the Fed only got 2% inflation one year from 1966 to 1996, what makes Powell so confident that the next 30 years are going to be 2% every year or maybe maybe miss it this, this next year and then it goes down there? Why should that happen? In fact, why is he so confident that the inflation problem has been solved? We just had this huge breakout in inflation. We had a year of 9.1%. We've pulled back a bit, but that's it. That means we can start cutting rates? No, I look back, too, at the evolution of inflation in the 1970s. So you can see it. You go back and look at these charts, the statistics on the Internet. But inflation was picking up in the 1960s. And it was because of the deficit spending of that time. Right? Remember, what was going on during the 1960s? Right. Well, you had mainly Lyndon Johnson was president, first Kennedy, but then Lyndon Johnson. But what'd you have? We had the uh, the Vietnam War, which was expensive. Uh, we had the war on poverty, which was also expensive. Interestingly, we lost both those wars. You know, we lost the Vietnam War and we lost the war on poverty, right? Poverty won. 
but we spend a lot of money on, on both those wars. Uh, then we also had the space race, right? We spent a lot of money on the space program uh, during during that, that time period. So the government was running these big deficits. Uh, they called it guns and butter, right? The guns was um, the, the military and the butter was, uh, you know, the, the, the welfare state, the great society programs. Where did the government get all the money to pay for all this stuff? Well, it, it borrowed it, right? They, they ran deficits and they printed a lot of money. And, and so naturally the consequence was inflation, rising prices. So it started in the 70s, in the 60s rather, and inflation peaked out. I wrote it down in, in, at 6.2% was 1969, a summer of love. Right. Well, Americans weren't loving uh, what was going on with prices in 1969. 6.2%. Uh, now, that was alarming, right? People were complaining at the time. Now, inflation came back down. And in 1971 and 1972, the CPI uh, was 3.3 and 3.4. Right, not two percent. Of course, they weren't talking about a two percent target back then. Right, that was that's new, but it was a big drop. Right, the the inflation rate got cut in half from that six point two, <clears throat> and back then, um, the Fed was saying, "Okay, you know, mission accomplished. You know, inflation's back under control because it had come down." The very next year, right, inflation jumped up to 8.7. And the year after that, it was 12.2 uh, or 12.4. I remember, where was that? 12.3, 12.3. Two years after being 3.2, it was 12.3. And the Fed was very optimistic that the inflation problem was solved in 71 and 72. And then of course, it got worse and worse and worse. It didn't really start coming down until 1982, right, uh, with Paul Volcker and the stuff he had to do. But it's interesting because the Fed was just as confident that the inflation problem was over in 1972 as they are right now. But if you actually look at the fundamentals, <clears throat> the Fed actually has more reason to be worried that inflation isn't over now than it did back then. We're in much worse shape. The budget deficits that we've monetized are far bigger, right? We have a much bigger problem. You know, interest on the national debt now is over a trillion. It's running on that pace. If you annualize, you know, what we're paying now over 12 months, we're at a trillion dollars a year, which again is more than national defense. But by sometime in 2025, sometime next year, interest on the national debt. If rates just stay where they are, right, it's going to be two trillion a year, which will mean that we're spending more money paying interest on the debt than we spend on Social Security or Medicare, which are enormous uh, problems on their own. But how can we even survive as a nation with that high an interest rate? Uh, I mean, in a bill, and the creditors are going to know that. That's the other uh, warning. That goal is setting. I, I guess I'll get to that one in a minute because I want to, you know, continue about the first warning, which is that the inflation problem has not been solved and the Fed is about to make it worse. You've got Powell out there saying we're going to cut rates and gold is giving him a big raspberry, right? The big thumbs down because gold prices are rising uh, as a result. Now, some people think, well, it's okay, right? If if because gold gold's going to go up when when rates go down, but if inflation was really coming down, then it wouldn't matter if the Fed cuts rates, because gold is sensitive to real interest rates, not nominal interest rates. So if inflation was going down with interest rates, that wouldn't necessarily benefit gold. The reason that gold is benefiting from these rate cuts or the potential for rate cuts is that inflation is going up. And so that guarantees that real rates 
are coming down, or in fact, real rates will be negative, which I think they will be. And that is one reason that the price of gold is going up. And it should cause Jerome Powell and the rest of the Fed to say, you know what? We got to call off these rate cuts because we've announced our intention to cut rates and gold just went way up. It's like you launch a trial balloon and the balloon, you know, got shot down. It crashed and burned. Look at the gold price. So, you know, that should cause the Fed to second guess and say, you know what? We're not cutting. The rate cuts are off. No cuts. Now, if they did that, maybe the price of gold would come back down. And that that that's what they should want, right? Because if gold is the canary in the coal mine, you want to keep that canary alive, right? You don't want that canary dead. And so the minute he, he he's acted kind of sick, you got to go, hold up. I got I to gotta change policy here. Uh, but they can't do that because the Fed's real agenda is not inflation. If it was, if the Fed really were concerned about inflation, especially given how it talks about the economy, right? The economy is great. The labor market is strong. Everything is great, yet we're going to start cutting rates. Why would you do that? That would be the last thing you would do. I mean, maybe if the economy was really weak and unemployment was really high, you might say, you know, we're not really sure about inflation. We've got mixed signals, but, you know, we got all these unemployed people. You know, we, we're, we're, we're going to have to do something. We're going to have to cut rates and if it means that inflation is a little higher, I guess that's a risk we're going to take. But if you're of the mindset that the economy is great, then why take that risk? Why start cutting rates? Why even tell the market that you're thinking about cutting rates when the mere expression of that thought is going to complicate your problem? Because by telling the markets to expect rate cuts, they're, you know, they're easing. That that's an ease. That is causing commodity prices to rise, right? It's causing the gold price to rise. So it's making that goal even less attainable. So if the Fed was hoping that inflation was going to come down to 2%, by admitting that they thought that that was going to happen and that they're going to cut rates, they now made it so much less likely that it actually will happen. It's you, cl you claim success and that claim assures that you fail. So what Powell should do is keep his mouth shut and not tell anybody that he's thinking about cutting interest rates, even if he is, and, and don't let the markets know that. So it's clear to me that the Fed is not concerned about inflation. Now, it can't admit that, so it has to pretend, but actions speak louder than words. And a Fed chairman who is telling the market that he is going to cut rates to expect rate cuts in the face of all this evidence that suggests that the inflation fire is not out, that it's about to come back and he's going to pour gasoline on it, that's proof that he doesn't care. So what is really driving Powell, right? If he doesn't care about inflation, then what the hell does he care about, right? Well, he cares about the debt and the enormity of the debt and the burden that these higher interest rates, they're not high by any historic sense of the word. They're just high in comparison to how low they were for the past decade and a half. And during that decade and a half, because rates were so low, everybody borrowed so much money. But because everybody now has so much debt, they can't afford these normal or even slightly less than normal rates that we have. And so that's why the Fed is cutting rates, not because it's winning the war against inflation. In fact, by cutting rates, it's surrendering and admitting that it lost. It just hopes that nobody uh, notices, although gold is clearly noticing. But they're trying to bail out the banks. They're trying to uh, bail out the government, corporations, everybody who has debt. You know, I, I saw another guy interviewed today, uh, some economist, and he was talking about you know, one of the great aspects of the economy today is how many Americans have these 30-year fixed rate mortgages at, you know, 3% and how this is so much 
you know, it's how it's so good for the economy is keeping the consumer spending. And that, you know, if we didn't have all these low rates, uh, consumers would be having a, a much more difficult time, which, which is true. Those consumers that have these rates, right, that own homes, because a lot of people don't own homes and they're just paying ever escalating rent. But of course, he ignored the elephant in the room, which is the banks that are holding on to these 3% mortgages. You can't just say this is great for the economy and point to the people who are winning from a 3% mortgage while ignoring all the people who are losing. <laughs> these are the people who own those mortgages. And it's not just banks. It's pension funds, right? Uh, and who, who are the beneficiaries of these pension funds? American public. There, there, there's a winner and a loser. For every mortgage borrower, there is a mortgage lender. So you can't talk about all the people who are winning because they have a 3% mortgage without talking about all the people who are losing because they're stuck <laughs> collecting that 3% mortgage uh, when interest rates are 5%. So that's another reason that the Fed uh, is going to be cutting rates. And I also think they're the majority of the rally is being fueled and probably including the AI stuff. Because if the Fed was still posturing that more rate hikes were coming, I don't think we'd see anywhere near uh, the price appreciation that we've seen in, in these stocks. So by talking about the rate cuts, they have been fueling this, this speculative frenzy in, uh, in, in these stocks. So this is the warning, right? Gold is seeing this. Gold is rising and hitting new highs, which also shows that the other assets that are going up, they're not really going up because gold is going up too. And again, it's not that gold is going up. It's that the dollar is going down. Now, you can't see it if you look at the dollar index because all the fiat currencies are losing purchasing power. I still believe that soon we're going to see the dollar crack against other fiat currencies. And when that happens, you're going to see a much more spectacular rise in the price of gold. I mean, if you think about what's already happened, we've seen this big jump in gold prices without a weak dollar relative to other fiat currencies. Imagine how much stronger gold would be if the dollar were also falling in relation to the euro, right? Or the Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, emerging market currencies, you know, the yen. If we saw a much weaker dollar, that's coming, right? There's no way that we're going to avoid that. In fact, look at what's going on with the bond market. Bonds got killed today and gold went up and made a new high. At the same time, in fact, the yield on a 30-year treasury is almost 4.5%. I think it could take out 4.5% this week. Um, what is that telling you, too? This is another warning. Because the Fed is going to be cutting rates. Okay, so why are yields rising? Because the bond market knows it's a mistake, too. Because bond investors realize that these rate cuts are inflationary, that the Fed is easing too soon, and rates are rising. This is going to complicate what the Fed is hoping to achieve by its rate cuts. Because if the Fed lowers short-term rates, but long-term rates rise in the face of that, and the yield curve steepens, that is going to create a lot of problems. You know, the mortgage market is not set by the Fed funds rate. It's more tied to the 10-year to the 30-year U.S. Treasury. So if those yields are rising, even as the Fed is talking about cutting or does, in fact, cut short-term rates, that is a big problem. But also, I think if the economy goes into recession, because again, or if it goes to the point where we officially admit that we're in a recession, 
rising long-term interest rates are going to complicate that recession because the the consumer is not going to get the benefit that he's used to. When the economy turns down, you know, you get the rate cuts. And oh, you could refinance your mortgage. No one's going to be refinancing their mortgage in the next recession because the Fed is not going to be able to lower mortgage rates because of how high inflation is going to be. Gold is telling you right now that this is not going to be like 2020 or 2008 or any of these previous recessions where the Fed was able uh, to provide this relief in the form of lower rates that helped, you know, reduce people's debt service burdens, provided a stimulus uh, to consumption. That's not going to happen. In fact, there's going to be a sedative, rising rates and rising prices, which are just getting started. I mentioned the, uh, the commodity price, the CRB index, and how much it's up. But what's more scary, look at a chart. In fact, I'm going to tweet it out again. I, I put it up there um, like a couple of weeks ago or two. But now I mean, we keep moving up, but we're just under the high from 2022. But we're about to take that high out. We'll probably take it out this week. But look at that chart. That chart looks like it's about to explode. I think the next stop is the 2011 high. That's about 15% from here. But I don't think that's going to be much resistance. I think we got a shot this year. And if not this year, by next year, of making an all-time record high in the CRB, that was set in 2008. And the only thing that brought it down was the 2008 financial crisis. But prior to that, the CRB was rising because the dollar was getting killed. In 2008, the dollar hit an all-time record low. We're no, nowhere near an all-time record low now. But I think we're going to get back up to that 2008, maybe this year. But if we do, if we got there this year, that would be a 50% increase in commodity prices in 2024, a year where the Fed is talking about having inflation coming close to 2%, much lower than it was last year when commodity prices were flat. I mean, nothing that is going on in the commodity market is consistent with the view that inflation is coming down. And in fact, I haven't seen anybody acknowledge this rise. Anybody at the Fed say, hey, wait a minute, check out what's going on with, with food prices. Uh, look what's going on with energy prices uh, and think, hey, may maybe maybe we're wrong here. Maybe we're a little premature in claiming victory on inflation. Maybe we should call off uh, these rate cuts. No, because they don't care. <laughs> and, and gold is telling you that they don't care. And again, foreign central banks realize that we don't care. They're holding all these dollars and they see that we're about to create more of them. We're going to cut rates in the face of mounting evidence that they're ignoring that inflation is going to be moving in the opposite direction. They claim that they want it down at 2%. All the evidence shows that it's headed higher and their response is we're going to cut rates. And so foreign central banks want to get out. Now, what is this also telling you? If you're looking at the dollar going up, right, because foreign central banks want to buy gold, that also tells you that the dollar is going to come down because they're buying gold instead of dollars. The global demand for dollars is falling as the supply of dollars is rising, our $2 trillion to $4 trillion budget deficits, our trillion dollar a year trade deficit, right? this is a massive supply of dollars without a, you know, offsetting demand for those dollars. The do demand is falling. And so that's going to mean even more upward pressure. What Powell should be doing right now, if he could, He'd be raising interest rates significantly to uh, offset this, to try to convince foreign central banks, hey, don't buy gold. Hold U.S. treasuries. Look, we're going to jack rates up. We're going to give you a better return than owning gold. But we're not doing that. 
And so the exodus from the dollar continues because the Fed is not doing what it needs to do to encourage holders of dollars to stay on board. And so as the dollar loses value, what does that mean about inflation? Well, prices are going to go up because all the import prices are going to go up because the dollar is going to go down. But it's not just import prices that are pushed up by a weak dollar. It's a lot of other stuff that we produce domestically because what happens with the domestically produced goods, if the dollar weakens, we end up exporting more of the stuff that we produce because now the stuff that we produce is cheaper for Asians or Europeans, and so they buy it. And so instead of selling those goods to Americans, we ship them you know, over to Europe or Asia. And so what does that mean? The prices of the stuff that we make here, even the stuff we don't import, is going to be impacted by a weak dollar. And of course, commodities are priced internationally in dollars. And so a weak dollar means higher commodity prices. That means higher raw material costs here in the United States. So you have all these warning bells flashing. Inflation is about to get a whole lot worse, yet Powell is confident that inflation is going to go back down to 2% and stay there till the end of time. Why? I mean, what is he looking at that tells him that that is going to happen? I mean, all he has is looking back at the prior 10 or 15 years, which is really from the 2008 financial crisis until 2020. And we had a lot of years where inflation was 2% or less, just by, by chance. We had that. And I can go over a lot of the reasons uh, for that, apart from the fact that the government lied about the numbers, right? So we didn't really have inflation that low. We just pretended it was that low. The problem is we can't pretend it's that low anymore because it's so much higher. It doesn't work unless you're going to go back and really cook the books again, right? We haven't cooked them enough, right? To, to, uh, to, to swipe away uh, how bad it, it is at this point. But other than that, what, what, is, what has happened? Nothing. That was an aberration. Where it, it, You have to look beyond that, right? Like the period I told you, 1966 to 1996. We didn't have any years other than one year over those 30 years where we had inflation of 2% or less. And we had a, a, a better macro environment, I think, then, I mean, things were bad then, but they're a whole lot worse right now. And again, the media not talking about it. And again, maybe they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to question these rate cuts, right? They love it, right? The financial media, Wall Street, they all want rate cuts. So why are they going to question the wisdom of doing it. Nobody is saying, wait a minute, they shouldn't be cutting. No, I heard it, that same economist that was on there today who was talking about um, how great it is that consumers have these low mortgages. He was asked if he's worried about uh, stagflation. And he said, no, no, I'm not concerned about that at all. He said, I might be concerned about recession, but not stagflation. And then he was asked about, is there a chance the Fed would raise rates? And he said, no, that's impossible. There's no way they would raise rates. And he may be right on that. But how could you think that's impossible? Because that means you think that even if inflation picks up, the Fed's not going to raise rates. Now, maybe he thinks it's impossible for inflation to pick up. But to say that it is complete impossibility that the Fed would raise rates, that's part of the problem. The Fed should raise rates if inflation gets worse. In fact, it's going to get worse. One of the reasons it's going to get worse is because the Fed has ruled out rate hikes and is promising rate cuts. That in and of itself ensures that inflation is going to get worse. But again, nobody questioning the Fed. Nobody is questioning the wisdom of these cuts. It's all, well, how soon are they going to start? And again, what Powell is saying is, he doesn't want to risk waiting too long to cut rates. Well, that's not a risk. So you wait too long. That's what he said uh, when he didn't want to raise rates. 
when inflation was heating up before he labeled it transitory, and then he did, why didn't he want to raise rates? He said, well, I don't want to risk hurting the economy just because we think inflation you know, may be getting bad. I'm going to wait. And of course, he waited so long, right? He let the genie out of the bottle. He should have preempted uh, the inflation. Well, the same thing now. He shouldn't be cutting too soon. Even if he thought the current interest rate was restrictive enough, which it's not, but even if he believed that, he needs to leave rates there a lot longer. And you know what? Not telegraph his intention. What the Fed should do is be absolutely quiet, not give any indication as to what it may or may not do. Don't say that you're going to cut rates. Keep your mouth shut until you cut them, right? Because if you simply say you're going to cut rates, in the future, you've undermined uh, your policy. Because as I said, indicating that you're going to cut rates makes it harder to actually cut them. Because by telling the markets your intention to cut rates, you have effectively eased before you want to. And so now if you were hoping inflation was going to go down, that would enable you to cut rates. By telling the market that that's what you're going to do, you made inflation go the other way. And now you make it harder to deliver on your promise. But, you know, the Fed doesn't want to do that. The Fed wants to give the markets exactly what it's told the markets to expect. But again, this isn't, you know, rocket science. This is pretty easy. So again, the Fed doesn't care. The Fed knows that the markets need lower rates. So the Fed is going to deliver them. And even if it can't actually cut them just yet because it would lose face, it's trying to have its cake and eat it too by promising rate cuts before it actually delivers them. But again, all of this shows you that the Fed's real agenda isn't fighting inflation. In fact, it's already surrendered. Inflation is won. That is the message uh, of gold. It's a loss of confidence in the dollar, a loss of confidence in the Federal Reserve. And the longer people ignore this rally and don't do something, the more they're going to lose financially. And if you think you're, you're, you're taking refuge in Bitcoin, you better think again, because Bitcoin is not safe haven. It's not gold. It's just a highly speculative digital token that could collapse at any time. And in fact, the higher the price of gold rises, the more likely it is that that bubble is going to pop. So anyway, before it does, I mean, people should be uh, calling up uh, shift gold. Silver, you know, is moving, but still very slowly. It's now finally above $25 an ounce. Uh, Again, it was at $50 an ounce in 2011 when gold topped out at $1,900. Gold's $300 an ounce higher, and silver is 50% below its 2011 high, which is also 50% below its 1980 high. Uh, This bargain isn't going to last. In fact, I bought some more silver myself from Mexico a few days ago. I called in an order and bought some more uh, uh, from Shift Gold. Uh, So I would would suggest uh, that people do that. Again, the mining stocks, they're moving up, uh, but still nothing. I mean, I think they're maybe almost back up to unchanged on the year ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. You can turn back the clock uh, and buy these gold stocks. If you didn't buy them because you didn't think gold was going to go up, now gold's gone up like $300 an ounce, you were wrong, but you could still buy the stocks at the same price, right? You rarely get an opportunity like that. Like I remember that that brokerage firm that downgraded uh, uh, Newmont about two months ago, and they downgraded it basically to a sell. They, they said they said a hole, but that's the equivalent of a sell on Wall Street. They said because they didn't see any upside in gold. Well, gold was 2000 It's over 10% higher now. That's a lot of upside in just a couple of months. They even said when they downgraded you know, a Newmont, and Newmont's up like 25% now since that downgrade. But they said when they downgraded it that if the price of gold went up, and they had a different outlook, well, they would reevaluate. Well, what are they waiting for? And if you remember on this podcast, the day of the downgrade, I bought more Newmont myself and I bought more the next day, right? I thought that was a Christmas present to me, uh, belated, to be able to buy 
on Newmont Mining because some idiot on Wall Street put a sell rating on it because he didn't think that gold had any upside. I knew that gold didn't have any downside. I was telling people 2000 was the bottom. How could you sell gold at 2000 when that was the floor? And there was no ceiling, right? There is no ceiling. We're in all time record highs. And I think it's just going to accelerate. And it's music to my ears that it's a stealth rally, that nobody is talking about it. Because while no one is talking about it, we can keep buying it. And again, on these gold mining stocks, uh, you know, if you've got the risk appetite, I, I think these are going to be huge, huge gains. You know, people are speculating in all the wrong asset classes right now. The gold miners, the junior mining sector, I think that's where the 10 baggers, the 50 baggers, the 100 baggers, that's where they are. You know, uh, but, you know, you don't have to find them yourself. You know, let Adrian Day do it. He runs my my gold fund, the Europe Pacific Gold Fund. You can buy the fund no load on any of the uh, the platforms, any of the big uh, discount platforms, or call up the brokers at Europe Pacific Asset Management. We can set you up a separately managed account and get into these stocks while nobody is paying attention, while people are distracted by the sideshow going on in, in Bitcoin. Uh, they're missing the main event. And, and so that's the perfect opportunity uh, for my listeners uh, to 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 increase their own positions in, in these assets to to maximize uh, the gains uh, when we get this explosive rally. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm going to do another podcast later in the week as we're getting the jobs report. So I'm probably going to do uh, a podcast uh, maybe the evening uh, of or the day of uh, that job report that comes out on Friday. So bye for now.